back at the book of Mark, the Gospel according to Mark, and we are in chapter 1. It's a really fast uh, recap or review, if you will. Um, you know, we talked about the four Gospels being the four portraits of Jesus Christ. The four facets, or the four, um, I would probably, portraits would be a better, uh, better term, where the Holy Spirit highlights certain things that he does not highlight in other Gospels. So, you know, the Gospel of Matthew, like we talked about it, it highlights that Jesus is the son of David, that he's the, the king of the Jews. And right off the bat, it starts with the lineage, right? The bloodline, and all those things. And then you have the Gospel of Luke. Um, this, he is highlighted, or the Holy Spirit highlighted him as the son of man. And you can see that, that um, it goes back, that his genealogy goes back to Adam. Not just the king of the Jews. He's the son of man. He's, um, you know, he relates to humanity. And we can see parable of the last sheep, last boy, and last son. So there's, there's differences that the Holy Spirit highlights. You know, the Gospel of John is magnificent. It highlights Jesus as the son of God. Um, that, and it starts out with, you know, 1-1 one, one in the beginning. Like, yeah. well, where is in the beginning? Well, before anything was created, it was God. And Jesus was with God, and he was fully God. And so, so the Holy Spirit really highlights Jesus' his divinity and his, how he relates to his Father. Very deep things, very important things. So in the Gospel of Mark, you will notice that the Holy Spirit highlights Jesus um, and he, as, a, as a servant of all. Okay. And you will find this term, and I kind of like it, it's, it's called immediately, right? After one task, he goes immediately. Tirelessly working, um, fulfilling the, the will of, of, of God. And so and that's where we are in the Gospel of Mark. And we talked about, again, it skips all the genealogy. Why? Because a servant doesn't need genealogy, right? Yeah. You're a bond servant, you're serving. You know, like, yeah, so, so you don't see that here. Um, and then it goes right into the Baptist, John the Baptist, very short, very brief. And then it talks about the wilderness. Again, it skips over the temptation of, this, of the devil if you read Luke or if you read Matthew. It's a little bit more information Holy Spirit gives us. But, and then it kind of, right after that, after, you know, uh, he comes out of wilderness and you will see he's going to start working, laboring on the field, right? laboring with whatever his father gave him the assignment. So, so here we are. Um, you know, and we see him in verse 14, 15, and verse 15, he went out and he came to Galilee and he said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. So he starts teaching the gospel. So verse 16, that's where we're going we're gonna to pick up. So and he, uh, I'm going to read it. And as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, Andrew, and his brother casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. So, you know, he sees um, their brothers as they're casting the net. And uh, they're fishermen. Yeah. Uh, we kind of think of apostles or disciples like these. And again, the, the, we probably saw it in the movie somewhere. They're like these bearded, aged, serious, you know, dudes. Uh, in reality, they were young people. Yeah. I mean, they were in their upper, tw- uh, I don't know, mid-20s, upper 20s, maybe low 30s. Jesus was 30. Yeah. So this was a youth movement. Yeah. So these were like young guys and they were just fishing. I mean, can you imagine just the ordinary day? You, you go to work, you just show up to work and you don't know that this day the Genesis 1 God is going to visit you. Not only visit you, He's going to call you and your name is going to be one of the platforms of the New Jerusalem. Right. He's going to write, I mean, incredible. And one, you know, there'll be 12 thrones in, in Israel, in the Millennium Kingdom, and they will rule, or they will, um, you know, they will rule over the 12 uh, tribes of, of Israel in the Millennium Kingdom. I mean, these guys are just fishing. They don't even know that there was a divine connection. Same with our lives. You just do your everyday, you know, you go to job, you, you do this, you do those different things, you work. But one day, there's this divine connection with Jesus. He meets you, or the opportunity opens, or the door opens, and before you know it, you're in the ministry. I mean, it's that fast. And we can't even imagine that. But again, it's in the ordinary things, it's in the little things, that God will find us. We will fulfill His will 
if we're just, you know, if you're faithful in little things as we work. So, so he's walking and he, he, he calls them. Uh, verse 17, he says, Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of man. Now he says, uh, if you follow me, I will change your profession. Now, this is a full-time uh, calling into the ministry. Now, um, not everybody, of course, is going to be called in a full-time ministry, but um, a lot of the times, God will call you into the full-time ministry. Now, we don't really, I believe, again, it's my kind of opinion, that we don't really choose that. I really believe God calls people in the marketplace. Uh, God calls people in, the, in certain areas where, where He wants to place them. And He decides that for us. But there are times when God really calls us into full-time ministry. Now, this is the time when He met them. Again, they're working. They're not even thinking about it. And then Jesus comes on this and He says, Follow me. I will make you fish of men. I will, uh, you will be fishing, but not fish. You will be fishing souls with me. So that's a full-time calling. Um, well, verse 18 again, that, that word, remember that word immediately. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Now, to quit a job, one would think like, oh, that's so cool, you know, disciples there. Of course, they would immediately quit their, their jobs and follow Jesus because it's Jesus. Well, they don't know who he is. So this is rabbi, this is a young Nazarene, a preacher, comes by and says, hey guys, how are you doing? Like, hey, hello, you know. Hey, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Um, and they like drop everything and go. It, I mean, it's astounding. We don't like you're working your job, and and you know this guy comes in and say, "Hey, God, you're done. Your work is done here. Follow my ministry. You know, God has great plans for you." You're like, I don't know. Let me talk to my wife first, right? <laughs> <laughs> these guys, <laughs> these guys, they feel connection with this young Nazarene. They don't know it. It's the Holy Spirit is calling them. They connect in their spirit to the heart of Jesus and they follow. It wasn't just like they thought oh, it would be kind of a cool idea to go with this guy. We don't know who he is, but hey, we're tired of fishing. Maybe it's something new. No, there was a divine connection. Your spirit will always connect to the calling and you know it's time, like in your spirit. Yeah. So like the question is, well, when do I start? When, you know, when God calls you, you will have this testimony deep in your human spirit. You will know that is time. I mean, you might kind of like you know, trying to figure out the details, but inside you will know God is calling you. Right. You will have the call on your, on your inner man. So I really believe that Jesus connected with them and they felt the calling. And that's why they were able to quit their job and follow Jesus. Amen. So he tells them and they immediately. Verse 19, when he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and John, his brother who also were in the boat, men in the net. So I'm assuming they're friends. They're probably, uh, you know, they're working maybe in the same business or maybe they had uh, different businesses. Um, maybe they were competitors. I don't know. But certainly they knew each other there. So these two brothers, John and James. Now, again, if you read the book of, um, you know, the Gospel of John and how John kind of writes a little bit about himself, he calls himself, you know, the man that Jesus loves. You know, he really wanted to highlight his, his love and dedication to the Lord. But actually, Jesus gave them names. Because when he was young, he was really on fire. He called the, in fact, Jesus called them um, the sons of thunder for a reason. They had this fiery personality. Now, you read the uh, book of Revelation, you know, chapter 1, how he sees Jesus. It, you know, he's older now, 90. And Jesus, you know, he just shows up and, and he sees his glory. He falls down and we know that passage really well. Uh, at 90, I mean, but back when he was young, I mean, he was just full of zeal. And if you remember at one time, he wanted to, even with his brother, call down fire from heaven to burn down the town that didn't really want to accept the, their ministry or their church. Um, so God, it's amazing. He calls people with different personalities, Right. Uh, it does matter. Our personalities, we're all unique. And Jesus loves unique things about us. And it's interesting how God will give him the name. So, verse 20, And immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. So they too, they leave their jobs and they follow Jesus, this young Nazarene. Verse 21, Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. Now, 
for a season, Jesus set up his quarter in Capernaum, meaning his, his, um, where he would do ministry. He ministered, I don't know, for about perhaps six months, maybe a little bit longer in Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is the city on the Sea of Galilee. It's probably the most northern part of Israel. I mean, back in, if you go back in the time where, let's say, if you had Jerusalem, and then the northernmost town, it would be Capernaum. So Jesus decides to set up his headquarters there for his ministry. And then, of course, he would come down to Jerusalem. He would set up fires. You know, he would um, heal a couple of people on the Sabbath, get all the Pharisees riled up, and then he would take off back to Capernaum. He did it on purpose. So <laughs> that's kind of unique. Um, he set some fires and then he would leave. You know, he would go yeah. to Capernaum. So, so he decided on that city. In fact, and because that city rejects him later on, because, you know, Nazareth, he comes to his town, and they, they don't like what he has to say. They like the miracles. People in Capernaum, people in, in his hometown, Nazareth, love the miracles. No issue there. What they didn't like is what he had to say. That was the problem. When he started preaching in the synagogue, they would get angry. Now, Jesus would like would kind of do this if you read the gospels he would say things that would offend our mind mm -hmm. to reveal what's on our hearts yes. so people are like oh we love these miracles yeah healing who doesn't love healing we all love healing deliverances yeah power of god hallelujah and then the truth comes in the gospel That's right. how we live how we conduct ourselves well we don't like we don't like that we don't like that kind of jesus that judges that um, that sets limits, boundaries, how we should live, the walking in holiness, all those things. Like, well, I like the Jesus of miracles, you know. Same thing back there. People loved what he did, but they had really hard, uh, hard um, time uh, accepting what he had to say, the truth. And it was important. So, so Jesus would do certain things or say certain things that would really offend them. And then that would reveal how much they loved them. Now, of course, we know that um, the disciples, uh, when some heavy theology was given in, and again, Gos uh, Gospel of John, <clears throat> chapter 6, about communion and eating, you know, his body, his, his drinking his blood. I mean, heavy, heavy. <laughs> they had no idea what he's talking about, right? But Jesus, he knows they don't understand him, but he still says it. Well, he says it to offend the mind. They're like, who could hear such things? eating the, I mean, drinking the blood, eating his flesh, this is just bizarre. Like, Jesus, just don't say those things, please. Like, heal people, like, do, like, nice things. <laughs> just don't say those things. This is embarrassing, right? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus is never embarrassed, the first thing. He yeah. does, he says, he always says the truth. He's a true witness. In fact, in Revelation chapter 1, he's called a true witness. He says true. That's good for us, because he'll say the truth about God, and he'll, uh, his father, and then he'll say the truth about us. Not like fake stuff. You know, oh, you're so amazing. He'll say exactly what he needs to say. He will offend our mind. He, some things we don't want to hear. But he does that to reveal the heart so he can heal it. That's right. And because everything goes back to the heart. I mean, back to the heart. He's for our hearts. That's right. So Jesus will do that. Um, and so, so, so he's operating in the Capernaum. Um, that's where he's preaching. So he goes to synagogues. So he's teaching in a synagogue. Verse 22, again. And they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Now, they, now the scribes, back then, like you'd be like, who are the scribes, right? They have the Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes. Um, you know, who are these guys? Well, the scribes were a group of people. Th their sole job would be to copy scripture. So for 10, 20 years, if you're a scribe, so you would do, and you can't make mistakes. It's not like, you had a whiteout. I mean, it was bad. If you made a one little dot or miss a dot or a little, I don't know, line is uh, whatever, big problem. So they were meticulously copying the Bible. Now they copied it so often because they had to copy by hand. They would know the Bible really well. Well, if you copied for twenty years, you know that you would know the Bible really well. So scribes knew the Bible. They would teach it because they knew it. They would memorize it because they had to copy it. Now Pharisees, they they came out of the scribes, but they were teachers, so they would be, you know, they, they would be teaching. Uh, so the Pharisee class would come out of the, of the scribes. They would know the scriptures really, really well. Now the Sadducees were people who, 
uh, they were usually more wealthy, and they were the lineage of, of priestly um, lineage. So they were more, uh, because, you know, to be a priest, you had to be from the, from the tribe of Levi, and, you know, from, from the offshoot of Aaron. So not, not anybody could be priest back, you know, back in the first covenant, only, only who got called. And so they were the elites. So they were people that were in the in the bloodlines uh, from you know. So they so they would do so they would be like the priests uh, in the temple. So they would do the sacrificial things and so. But they had a lot of influence and a lot of um, a lot of power as far as the people were concerned. So these scribes, so people know the difference. So this scribe, the people, learned people. Now they were teaching the word of God. The only problem was that it was not filled with the breath of God. You know, they were teaching the letter of the law. Well, what does the letter of the law do? It kills people. Why? Because it exposes sin and judgment of God for, for sins. And so when you teach the Bible, you can take even New Testament. If you teach it without inspiration of the Holy Spirit that brings life, whatever you're saying is, will not produce anything in people except condemnation. Right. Or, so when you teach the Bible... You have to be filled with life. You can't be just, you know, go to school, kind of, oh, this is kind of cool, you know, I'll be a theologian. You kind of decide for yourself. You can be the best theologian in the world. You can know all the scriptures. But if it's not, if there's no breath of God on what you have to say, we'll do absolutely nothing except condemn people and they will feel, you know, like, you know, that they're sinners and so on and so forth. So when Jesus starts preaching, well, same Bible. But when he said things, there was breath of the Holy Spirit on it. And people were listening and life began to touch him. So, so that same word that scribes preached would condemn them. When Jesus preached the same word, it brought life. It, 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 that same word became, started doing something within their hearts. They're stirring their hearts. It was bringing life to them, actually. So the Bible became living when Jesus spoke because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. All right, so they could see the difference right away. Well, what happened then? Well, verse, let's see. Um, well, he was teaching with authority. So again, it's the spiritual authority. Verse 23. Now, there was a man in their synagogue. And you can, re so easy to understand, replace the word synagogue with church. Okay, so let's just say there was a man in the church with an unclean spirit. And he cried out. All right, so you have a church service. So Jesus comes up to preach. So he opens the scroll. You know, he finds the place. Starts preaching. Holy Spirit fills the words. What does it do? What does it produce? Well, the unclean, this guy was sitting, you know, on the, at the church service. Probably went there every year, you know, it was just fine. You know, just a part of routine. We all go to church. They all went to, you know, on a Saturday. They all went to synagogue and having, you know, he just, his, but something was different. When Jesus spoke with spiritual authority and Holy Spirit was released from his lips, from his breath. Because to speak, you have to use your lungs. There's breath behind words, right? So when he was speaking, well, the demons start manifesting. So this guy, the demons in that person, manifested in church. And he cried out, verse 24, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So these, this, this person was not only possessed with one demon, it was, because it's in plural, we know there was many demons that 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 person had. And demons always recognize spiritual authority. I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of people that try to cast out devils, um, you know, and they use the name of Jesus. They might use techniques that they, you know, they see on the internet or whatever. They kind of watch a couple movies and like, okay, I, I think I can do this. <laughs> but if there's no breath of, if there's no spiritual authority that you have, meaning that if you don't walk with God wholeheartedly, if you don't, if you're not filled with His Holy Spirit, if you don't come in with God, you don't have spiritual authority to do that. The demons will just laugh in your face. Why? Because you're not walking the things you're... Or in fact, you might be doing the same things as, they, as these people are doing. So you have no spiritual authority. So they can say, in the name of Jesus, you know, we cast you out. And the devil be just, might be just laughing at them because they lack spiritual authority. Well, why do we lack spiritual authority? Because we're not wholeheartedly walking with God. If we're walking with God with our whole hearts, we really, I'm not said perfect, I said wholehearted, meaning 
you know, we give it all. I said, God, this is it. I mean, I know it's, it's not much, but it's my whole heart. Right. And, and, and I love you, God, and you love me, and then I love your word. And you talk to him in these conversations. What happens? You start growing in spiritual authority. And you might be really small, tiny, you know, you know, 80 pound person. But when you speak, the devils will react. Why? Again, because the words you say, there's power behind it. There's spiritual authority. And they recognize that. So Jesus spoke and the demon, uh, uh, they start cried out. And, and again, they, they, dis- they said, you came to destroy us. So now that they're thinking... Because they, they probably perceived that uh, if he came, it was probably the time or he's going to restore the... I don't know, I'm guessing that it was um, because there's two, sec- no, two, two comings. Uh, so they thought that he was going to end their reign on earth. So that's why they cried out. You came before your time to destroy us. Like, what is going on? I thought we had more time. Again, I'm thinking that based on what, 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 they, what they're screaming out. And of course, they know who he is, the Holy One of God. Verse 25, But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, and come out of him. Now, he, he told them basically to shut up. And the reason, I believe, again, I mean, kind of my thoughts on this one, uh, because he didn't want demons to basically um, exalt him. So, because he says, I'm not, we're not on the same team. Yeah. You know, we're not on the same team. Don't, I don't want to hear your exaltations of, of who I am. So you would, you would kind of read, like, why would he always tell them to, to shut up, you know? When they, oh, you know? They would bow before him, and they, would, and they would say, you're the son of God. And he would say to them, be quiet. Don't, because he don't, I, I guess, it's my opinion, when people are, are kind of watching, and they're like thinking, huh. So he says, I'm not with them on any level. Yeah. On any level. They're my enemies, and I don't want to hear their praises. I don't hear nothing. Yeah. I want them out. And um, basically, again, that's kind of what I'm thinking, why he, why he told them to be quiet. Verse 26. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Now, again, this, this um, verse 26 kind of shows what happens when you pray for people. Or how does deliverance look sometimes? Well, it looks sometimes where the body, when, when the unclean spirit leaves, the, the body can, can, you know, can fall down. It can, it can do different things. Uh, when, when the demon's coming out. So we kind of see here uh, how Jesus was casting out devils. Now, of course, when we're using his name to cast out devils, a lot of the same things happen in our ministry. So, you know, when we pray for people, and a lot of times they would get convulsed, they would do certain things, they would fall down from the chair, they would do it. So it's not uncommon, even, you know, in, in Jesus' time. So, so it kind of when we see something like that happen, we're like, oh, okay. So, it's, so we correlate that with the scripture, that Jesus did it, and that's how this looks like. So we find it in, in the Bible. So I really believe Holy Spirit put it in there. So when we're praying, we're like, like what is going on? Like, well, when we start praying, you know, uh, originally, it, it's one of the things we were surprised. Like, like, you just pray for the person, like, you know, like softly, and then the person just like, like flares up and like, oh, what's going on here? You know, like you wake up. Um, but because Holy Spirit, uh, through, through, through the Gospel of Mark, highlighted that uh, when, you, when you're casting out demons, these things can happen. A person can fall down, you know. So it's not, uh, not normal. It actually was already, you know, in Jesus' time, happened all the time. So that kind of gives us at least an idea of what it's supposed to look like when we do pray for people like that. All right, so, um, so he cried out with a loud voice. Again, that's the whole element of falling, you know, screaming. And he came out of him. Verse 27. Now, people are watching. Now, this is a church service. Yeah, this is like preacher number one. Came out preaching, and it's like in the middle of the service. It's like kind of disruptive, right? Like people are like, what is going on here? This is not normal. <laughs> this is not your average Sunday service. They were all amazed. So that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. They never seen anybody use such spiritual authority and power. Right. Not one man in the Old Testament, not one prophet, cast out devils. Like a man would have such authority over the demonic realms. That was unheard of in the first covenant. Like, so they're like, what is this? This is new. We've never seen any man have such authority in the spiritual realms. Now, of course, it's Jesus. You know, he's fully God, filled with the Holy Spirit, fully man. 
of course, he's, he has all authority is given to him. Um, but they don't know that. They, 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 you know, they saw him grow up. I mean, like, yeah. Jesus, like, you were running on the streets. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? Like, what is this? What is, who gave you this authority? Yeah. They were, had all these questions. They, they just could not put the things together. Like, because we know this guy. Jesus, you were very nice. You know, you, you're a good carpenter. Like, what is going on here? Yeah. Where do you get such power, such anointing? Well, of course, we know he's fully God. But they did not know that yet. So they're like, what is this new doctrine? Um, even now, you, um, you start talking about those things, and a lot of the people, like, they're still like, perplexed. Like, casting out devils, what does that mean? Like, like, like it's a new doctrine. This doctrine is 2,000 years old, okay? It's not new. <laughs> you have to go back to the book of Mark to understand it, that this is normal when we preach the gospel, we cast out devils, and we heal the sick. This is a normal part of the gospel that we preach, of the kingdom of God in, that's going to come in power. It's what we should be doing as disciples of Jesus. We are, in fact, because we're born again, we are joined with Christ in one spirit. We are seated in the heavenly places. Well, how are we seated? Well, by faith, because our spirit is connected to the Holy Spirit. We have the authority that He has. By using His name, we exercise that authority through us on earth. So the will... So whatever is in heaven, by saying things, we bring it down to earth, right? So we bind and loose. And if we bind it, the heaven binds it. If we say loose it, the heaven will loose it. So that's great authority we have in the name of Jesus. Okay? Now, to exercise that authority, we have to, again, walk with God with full obedience, with, with a loyal heart. That's when that authority is fully manifested, where we're connected spirit to spirit with the Lord. We're joined with the Lord, and we become one spirit with the Lord. That's important. A lot of times people don't, don't, don't have a relationship with God. They, they just have a label. They're Christians, you know, they go to church, but they don't have that vibrant, they're not on the vine. So there's no dispensation of the Holy Spirit power going through there, because they're not connected with the vine, simply as that. They're a branch that's been cut off from the source of power and authority. So to walk in that, we have to be joined on the vine. It's called the mutual abiding. We abide in Him, but we talk to Jesus, and He moves on our heart. He talks to us. He moves within us. That's how we abide. And, and when we say things in the spiritual realms, they, they, things shift, things move, we bind, we loose, and all those things. So, so they're wondering, what is this going on? What's this new doctrine? All right. Uh, verse 28, and immediately, again that word, his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Well, one of the things that Holy Spirit loves to do is to make the name of Jesus famous. And I love that about the Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus said in the Gospel of John, he says that Holy Spirit, he will glorify me. So like, Holy Spirit, what is on your heart? Like, God, like, what do you really want to do? Well, he would say, I want to make the name of Jesus famous, not only in your life, but in the city you go to, in the work, to make the name. Well, how do how or how does Holy Spirit makes the name of Jesus famous when His power is released through us? Well, Jesus cast out some devils. That guy probably was very excited. He didn't even know he had so much. He probably had issues, but he thought it was just him. I'm not going to say any, you know, probably didn't want to tell anybody, maybe, I'm, I'm assuming. So they will think he's crazy, you know. Like I, you know. And so he was quietly maybe holding this on. And now this man, this, this young Nazarene, just frees him from that burdens. Man, I mean, can you imagine how happy that guy was? So when Jesus started casting out devils, well, his fame, because the power of God was released through that man. And like, he became famous. And the Holy Spirit was smiling because why? He loves to make the name of Jesus famous. And so do we. We want the name of Jesus to be famous. So for His name to be famous, we have to walk in holiness. We have to be wholehearted. We have a loyal heart. And we have to do the works of the ministry. Cast out devils, praying for the sick, you know, praying for one another, all those things we do. And when God releases power and it touches other people, well, the name of Jesus becomes famous. Because people can see that through His name, you know, the demons obey, the sicknesses flee, all those things, like lives get restored. 
and it makes us happy. Why does it make us happy? Because the name of Jesus is famous and we love him. So every time he gets a little bit more famous, it's good for us. I like it. It makes me happy. So when we minister, we become actually happy inside because we see Jesus move, change people's lives, and that excites us that Jesus' name is becoming famous. So the Holy Spirit, he loves to do that. All right, so became famous in verse 29. Now as soon as they had come out of synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So it kind of tells us that some of the disciples were married. So again, I know maybe somebody thought these disciples were these, you know, learned single young men, like, like you see in the movie, these 50-year-old looking guys with beards, like Peter, you know, like this young guys, young people. It's youth movement, right? But some of them were married. Not everybody, um, you know, were, were single, you know, like Paul, he was single, he was dedicated to the Lord. So that means we all have our assignments, right? So God determines for us to have families. Uh, for some, he may determine to be a celibate. Again, it's the gift that we all have gifts. So some guy says, well, I really want to know person into God and I, wanna, I don't want to marry. I really want to do this. It's a, it's, it's a good thing to, to say and to do, but you really have to ask the Holy Spirit if it's the assignment from the Lord. Not that what I want to do, right? Because I want to be like Paul, right? I want to be really committed like Paul, maybe even a little bit more. Um, because what, what, why is it important? Because when you start ministering from that place, you think, you know, you got this, you know, just me, I, I, I can really do this, I don't want to be hindered. And that's not God's plan for you. His plan is for you to have a family and raise, you know, children. And God has plans for those, again, children, because they have ministries and destinies and so on. A lot of people get in trouble. They come in and they don't have that grace to stay single. So then the devil will trap them, okay? So in those questions, like if you were disciples of Jesus, we have to always ask Lord, like, what is my assignment? It's very important to know um, your calling. And if, if you're called to be married, it's good. So don't feel like you're going to you know, lose out because you have to watch kids or, oh, well, how am I going to do this now? Don't even worry about that. That's an assignment. Jesus really loves those things when we obey Him, right? And time will come, and He knows your address, trust me. He will... Um, he will use you at what again it's it's whatever his will is for you you want to accomplish all of it and so um, from this passage I mean there's a highlight where where some of the disciples were married and they were they had, I'm assuming they had children so not all of the disciples were single so that's kind of a neat point that the Holy Spirit uh, highlights it's good for me because I really loved Eugenia so I was like God I don't want to be like celibate like Paul right <laughs> Not my gift, I'll tell you that. Once I saw her, I knew it was not my gift. <laughs> All right, so anyways. All right, let's keep going, Vito. Keep going. All right, so. Uh-huh. Uh, so they told him, so verse 31, So he came and uh, took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. So again, he ministers to our family members. Now we think like Jesus, you know, like as far as ministry, we sometimes don't even think how personal he is, you know, like he, like he cares about our children, our relationships, uh, our friends that we care about. So Jesus is as much interested and cares about other people as we do. So we kind of think that we, um, you know, ah, it's now no big deal, like who, who cares about, you know, and we're not. But uh, Jesus does care, you know, if, you're, if your mother-in-law is sick, uh, pray for her. Jesus cares about her being, you know, getting well as much as, as he cares about, you know, the nations being saved and all those things. He's very personal. And Jesus loves um, doing things for us, like touching our friends, our, our sphere of influences. So um, that's why we always, in the relationship with him, we ask him, you know, you know, uh, people that we really love, we say, hey, that Jesus, can you just touch them and bless them and, uh, you know, all those things. He is very personal. He really does care. So when Simon's mother-in-law was sick, it's not like Simon like, you know, told her to kind of hide herself while you know, Jesus is here. He said, no, no, Jesus, come. You have to touch her. It's my mother-in-law. I love my mother-in-law. That's another point for another time. That's, so uh, it could be a sermon out of that. All right, so she, not only she got well, but she got strength to serve them. 
32 verse 32 at evening when she when the sun had said they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon possessed now again interesting um, term here demon possessed because I really believe that the people that the, or maybe in the, in the translation it would be easier to understand as demonized because demon possession would imply ownership right and that's that's not really true because um, uh, because devil doesn't really own a, a human spirit all souls belong to God so I really believe it's demonized meaning there's parts of their being that's been under demonic influence yeah. okay yeah. so it's kind of a strong word so when you see somebody that has some influences demonic influences in some areas not maybe all areas so let's not call them demon possessed right. let's just not use the term rather just say yeah there's there's they're, they're demonized meaning there's influences demonic influences in yeah. there so so I, even though the translators kind of translated that way so I would I would say probably easier to say that and you will be more correct because again possession implies ownership yeah. so now they've the his fame is spreading and so they're bringing all of the sick all of those people that are demonized to the door now when we uh, pray for revival we kind of th we don't think about the details we want like God's power released and of course we want him to release it through us right we all want to be great it's actually something you can't repent of it's it's, it's a longing of the heart so don't think like if you want to be great that's bad it's not bad it's how you get there that could be bad right yeah. but the longing of the heart to to um to do something that lasts for eternity everybody has that that you cannot repent of it you'll always have it to be great in the eyes of god let's put it that way we think like okay you know god's power and you know healing and all these things happening and then you go home and then it's kind of it's kind of like um the crusade stays there and then you have your own little life doesn't happen that way if God uses you right if he uses you in healing or different ministries in a very profound way you can forget about privacy yeah. <laughs> people will surround your house they'll beat your door down people with need sick people all of the issues it's not that you're gonna tune them out not gonna happen you can forget about privacy so when when if you asking him god to use you in a very mighty way there's there's some caveats to that it's great the glory of god the name of jesus is becoming famous but you can forget about privacy anywhere you go there's people can you pray for lines of people yeah. you sit in the car people surround your car can you pray for me can you pray for me? can you pray for my mother can you because we care and we know that you know there's a revival going on here and and god is using these people here and um, you can forget about privacy. So sometimes just kind of think about it like, well, maybe I kind of I like my privacy. I, maybe I don't want people beating down my door. So uh, in his case, Jesus is literally they around the house like Jesus. You know, they'll bring him from all over the place. And again, the Holy Spirit is highlighting that Jesus is the, the, the greatest servant. Okay. He just works and works and works. He's not thinking, okay, okay, you guys, you know, that, you know, the the, uh, the service is done tell these people to go home no he's staying there and he's ministering he's he's working and working and working so that's a and it's not like he he became that you know because um you know he had no choice that's who he is in nature yeah. even before he became man <laughs> he's the servant of all like god you're the servant of all genesis one god like how could this be like it is his nature to serve so when Jesus came it's not like he like had to put on the servanthood like you know he served for three and a half years and then like uh, you, know, uh, you know ascended back to heaven and said whoo well I'm glad that's over you know <laughs> all that work Whew, that whole humanity thing I'm glad that's done no he's even now he's ministering he's praying and interceding before God for me and you my two that hurt today I'm praying to God and Jesus is like father I mean, his teeth is really hurting you know you, <laughs> you might want to touch him so he could teach today and that's not hurting now so I said at least for that portion if you touch me it'll be good so I can so I can teach uh, again he's he's working he's intercessor forever why because he lives forever okay. it's amazing so so again Holy Spirit highlights that he's the servant of all 
All right, I hope I have still more time. Um, okay, so I'm going to wrap this up. Okay, so the whole city is gathering together at the door. Verse 34, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll read this and then we'll stop. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Again, it's a dynamic. He didn't want demon worship. He says, we're not on the same team. Uh, I don't want your worship. I don't want to hear it. So he would shut him down right away. So, and again, various diseases. No disease known to man can withstand the power of Jesus and his anointing of the Spirit of God. No demon can resist the power of the Holy Spirit that is in Jesus. His words, I mean, so, um, and again, that authority that Jesus operates, if we are in Him, if we always talk with Him in prayer and, and have a, this, this communion with the Lord, and, and we're wholehearted, not perfect, wholehearted, um, we can walk in that authority. Right. And when we pray, demons will leave and people will get sick. So we'll stop there and we'll pray. Thank you, Holy Spirit. i just so happy today, Lord, uh, that your beautiful Son, God, that beautiful portrait that you have given us through Mark, God, your servant, the beautiful portrait of Jesus as a servant of all, God, that he, he actually lived it. He not only spoke, but he did it, God. He did it. He sacrificed his time, his energy, God. He wasn't eating. He wasn't sleeping. He was working. He was working on, uh, on, on your assignments, Father, because He really does care deeply about the people, Lord, and He was healing, casting out devils. Holy Spirit, I'm just so thankful that, that Jesus is a servant of all, and, and you um, just highlight those things about our Lord, and we love Him, and we love all the little details that you have for us, Holy Spirit. I thank you for unlocking those to our human heart, making, making it um, comprehensible to, us, to our heart, Lord, and I'm just so thankful. Thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done for us tonight. Amen.